I'll let you guys kind of um, start the meeting off then. Or no, you want me to start? <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. You can like introduce yourself. Okay. Okay. Hey guys. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm Dr. Daniel Sagai. I'm a board certified dermatologist in Seattle. Uh, my wife is a proud uh, graduate of UC Berkeley. She's class of 2008. So she's spent some time, but she was a nutritional science major and she's an internal medicine doctor. Uh, and we went to the University of Hawaii uh, University of Hawaii, Johnny Byrne School of Medicine for medical school. And that's where we met. Uh, so my journey, I started off growing up in Hawaii, uh, North Shore of Oahu, very small surfing town uh, called Waialua. It's only 3,500 people in the population. So a small town versus Berkeley being over 120,000 people. It's a very small percentage of what you guys deal with. But I grew up in a small, close-knit community, um, rural, very, you know, I say I'm a country boy, surfing town uh, route. So um you know, we always talked about Honolulu being making it big. If you ever go to school in Honolulu, that's the big time there. And we, we'd always had this inferiority complex. And then when I uh, went to high school in, in Honolulu, that was huge. When I got into a charter school there, um, it wasn't a true private school. But after that, the whole question was, do I have the money to go to the mainland like UC Berkeley or such to go to school? And I didn't have the funds really to go to the mainland. So I saved money. I stayed back at University of Hawaii, went to a state school. And um, again, having that inferiority com complex, applying to medical school. I'm coming from UH. I'm going to be going against people like my wife who went to UC Berkeley or other people who went to Stanford or Harvard. And so I had that, um, I had to overcome those little insecurities, but I use it to my advantage. I call it the underdog mentality. I think using it to your advantage. So I studied biology. I got my BA in biology at University of Hawaii and um, minored in art. So I really liked combining art and sciences. Um, I did art history. I did pastel work. I like drawing. So I did all those classes with my prerequisites for medical school. And I know some of you are doing, uh, like Melanie, are doing organic chemistry, which um, they say is the weeder class. And I'd say that's probably one of the most difficult classes you will face. In our, in our school, it was organic chemistry and anatomy and physiology, the advanced courses uh, like those. Biochemistry was okay, but um, organic chemistry, if you can go through that, you're not going to breeze through it. But if you can, you know, do fairly well, you're going to be set for med school, um, I would say. So in terms of um, the application process, I started, uh, well, first, I guess you, you do all your extracurriculars. For me, I did um, volunteer work. I volunteered at Kaiser Permanente for four summers as uh, right out of high school. I started going every summer and I would shadow plastic surgeons, ENT doctors, would go in the OR and even see surgeries. And I got letters of recommendation um, by doing data entry and try to do some research projects. I didn't do any bench research. I know a lot of people focus on trying to do bench research. I'd say, you know, I think clinical research is totally fine. I didn't publish anything before medical school. So I wouldn't stress too much about it. I know the climate may have changed. It might be more competitive, but I don't think that you should be feel discouraged or even feel like you have to take an extra research year if you don't have that. I focused on other things like student government. I was Senator of the College of Arts and Sciences in college. I did other jobs like I tutored physics and chemistry. I took notes um, in this program called COCUA, where we would take notes for uh, students with disabilities. Uh, and I would also read um, uh, textbooks and record them so that visually impaired students could also go through textbooks at home and listen to my recordings. Uh, so I did those kinds of things. And uh, I also got a scholarship that would cover my tuition, give me a stipend, but also gave me a travel fund. So I went to India and I did even more medical um, shadowing and I uh, got to see the hospital setting, the OR, the outpatient setting with primary care doctors. So that was a really eye-opening experience that I actually used in my personal statements for medical school and even residency. So I did that uh, right after my junior year of college, applied after my junior year of college after taking the MCAT. And uh, I only took the MCAT once. It was average. My SATs were average. My MCAT was an average score. I did take Kaplan as a MCAT prep course, and I would recommend that. Uh, and I'll go into like standardized testing because that's another important part. I, I actually don't want people to think, oh, just because I'm an average test taker, or not even a good standardized test taker, it does not mean that you are going to be set in stone. It's going to be like that for USMLE uh, board exams in medical school because 
um, when I entered medical school. Thankfully, I got in on my first try. And I went to University of Hawaii, saved a lot of money. Tuition back then was only 25000 a year, which is a total steal nowadays to go to medical school um, for four years. And um, you know, the step, there's three steps to become licensed in the United States to become a, a licensed physician. There's a US, U.S. Assembly step one, which you take after your second year of medical school. They say that is the most important exam of your whole medical journey, which I would say is was, was, was true at the time. Um, when you guys matriculate into medical school, it's probably going to be pass or fail at that point. But for me, you had to do really well in that exam. So I had to study my butt off for that exam. I, 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 I um, went into medical school just as the average test taker. And then I performed so well by doing practice questions. It's all about repetition. Do a, you know, subscribe to as many Q banks as you can and just go through questions every day and train your mind to even get so used to the questions, reading the prompt that you'll know what even the multiple choice answers will be. And you can kind of, you can already think, well, they're gonna quest, uh, quiz me on all these things. I know which one to choose. So that's how good you're gonna get. And I scored in the, you know, over 95th percentile for the um, step one exam. So that made me stand out um, for residency because as you, many of you know that dermatology is one of the hardest specialties to match into. It's up there with orthopedics, plastic surgery, ophthalmology, radiology. Um, and my, during my time, it was probably the most competitive to get into. So I had to really shine coming from University of Hawaii and applying against people who went to medical school at great, you know, UC schools and such. So um, that that was that was good to differentiate me from others. And it, step two is something you take in your after your third year of medical school, and that's less important. But I also did very well in that one too. And then step three is the least important. That's in your after your intern year of. Um, uh, you know, your first year of residency or intern year. Um, and that's less difficult, but very basic science heavy for step one. So you're training your mind to get really good at basic science memorization as in organic chemistry, and you're going to continue that on into medical school. Um, in medical school, uh, you're going to, you know, my, my medical school is only 64 students at the time. I was class president. I was vice president for the first two years of medical school. I was class president the second two years. And um, so I still kept up with leadership, did a lot of volunteer work. I was president of the Honor Society, the AOA Honor Society Medical School. I started up a medical student chapter for um, John A. Burns School of Medicine, the AMA medical student chapter. So I went to Chicago for meetings and um, was really much into legislative, like patient uh, access rights and such. So I was involved with those things in addition to trying to study your butt off for doing well on standardized tests. Step, uh, my other big um, thing to emphasize is uh, your third year of medical school, your clinical years, try to do your best in honoring them and doing well. So it's not just about being book smart, but also being clinically smart as well. And just being a good team member or someone who's really easygoing, someone who um, you're okay being on call with. If you're up doing like an 18 hour shift with somebody, you don't want to be a total jerk. You want to be a team player. So definitely, you know, it's it's a, it's a balance. It's, you don't want to be too heavy with the books, but you also want to have good interpersonal skills and good communication skills. Um, I did my residency at Harvard Medical School, so I, I was very fortunate to match into that um, program, which you cover Mass General Hospital, which is probably the best hospital in the country up there with Mayo Clinic and Brigham and Women's, Beth Israel, Boston Children's. And it's um, I did one year of internal medicine at one of the Harvard hospitals and then three years of dermatology at all the uh, Harvard affiliated hospitals, including Boston Children's too, which was great. And, um, you know, getting into dermatology is very, very difficult. Some people even say you got to get a PhD or do an extra research year. I didn't do a research year. I just went straight in. Um, you know, I just felt that I had nothing to lose by going in with a good score, good extracurriculars, good leadership experience. I didn't do a lot of research. I did do a one month rotation of research at Wake Forest with um, Dr. Steve Feldman, but otherwise I didn't go crazy with the bench research still. Research was never my, my, my focus. So um, I wanted the, the admissions committees to focus on all, everything else, um, my other um, extracurriculars. So I applied and thankfully I got over 12 dermatology interviews. They always say shoot for about six to seven, but I got invited to 12. And if you get invited to any, if you get invited to 20, go to all 20 if you can, because that increases your chances of getting in to a dermatology residency program. 
my second choice was Mayo Clinic, um, but I was very happy. You know, I had choices and very fortunate. So I, I did my, my residency there and then I came here to do um, private practice. I've been with the same uh, practice for the last four years and um, really happy. And it's a good mix of medical, uh, dermatology, surgical. I get to excise tumors, cysts, lipomas. I get to do some cosmetics, Botox, fillers, chemical peels, some lasers, and then um, see kids, pediatrics as well. And, um, you know, lifestyle is good. I work four days a week and no call. And, you know, my weekends are off to talk to you wonderful people and do some TikToks and Instagram uh, posts. And um, I started that up because of the pandemic. When everything shut down, I didn't have, uh, it was end of March and all of April, we shut down. And so I was only working one half day a week in clinic, whereas I'm used to seeing 120 patients. That's how busy my weeks are. And so I was only seeing like five people a week for emergencies, emergency skin infection or a bad rash, or I found a few melanomas during the, the lockdown. So um, I was just kind of saying like, you know what, I'm just going to go talk to a camera and do a YouTube channel, which has grown. And now it's monetized and this, I'm um, a YouTube partner and such. So it's, it's really grown um, into something I didn't expect it to become. And um, Instagram too, which is more as like a, a way to just market myself while I wasn't really seeing patients. Um, I'm having a good time with it. So it's a nice hobby. It's become a second job because I'm getting a lot of like um, contacts from other brands and um, scrub brands and cream, you know, skincare brands and such. So um, it's kind of neat, it's fun, um, but it's a great way to network and also to reach young minds like yourself. And um, just speaking to Tiffany and Melanie already, I can tell I'm really impressed. You guys are doing great things. So um, let's see here. Was that, that's not even half an hour there, but um, I guess I can open up to questions um, already. Um, I actually have a dermatology related question. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about collagen supplements? It's a good question. It's a very common question. The data um, is mixed. There are, you know, some studies that say it does help um, taking oral collagen. I know in the Asian um, community, they actually are really huge on collagen. I actually tell my patients, I don't believe in it right now. The studies that do show that it helps is not very strong. Um, not strongly powered. So I would say it's not uh, something that I would tell people to go and do right now, but good question. <laughs> uh, I have a more general question. Yeah, sure. I was wondering um, what influenced your decision to go into dermatology? Yeah. Or like, Do you have any advice for, uh, for students who are debating between going to pre-med or pre-health like myself? Great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess the dermatology question, um, initially I thought I was going to do plastic surgery. I really like combining the visual aspect with medicine. And, um, I really, uh, my experience in India, I saw, uh, I, I always start off my personal statements talking about this young girl with a really bad burn on her, her, um, extremity and her shoulder. And she was just so severely burned. They had to drive, um, hours to see a doctor and, um, to treat her. And, you know, she was so young and to see her, she's probably going to actually scar pretty terribly. Um, it really, it really was eye opening, like I said, and it was, um, I, I liked how plastic surgery could help patients like that. And so I, I was, I did all of medical school, most of my med, like 75% medical school saying, telling people I want to do plastic surgery. I linked up with plastic surgeons. I did some research papers. I learned how to suture with a plastic surgeon. And then um, third year came around and you do all of your rotations. I did general surgery. I did well in that. I did internal medicine. You know, I honored every rotation. And then I realized at the end that I didn't want to stand up in the OR for 10 hours to remove fat off of someone's arm, you know, and do a lift. And that 10 hours, I could see, you know, 30 patients and, and make an impact on them. And um, I also like the investigative part and the detective work. I can diagnose just by seeing you know, or plastic surgery. A lot of it's just problem solving on someone's problems. They come into me, they come and say, I don't like this part, or I have a burn. I need, I need some kind of reconstruction. Then the problem solving is neat and trying to, um, it's fascinating actually uh, that how to help somebody. But I also like 
that dermatology has that aspect. Plus you can make some um, diagnoses as well. Uh, but my art background definitely had a influence on that. And I'm also a social butterfly. I like being in clinic. I like meeting um, a ton of people. I really like the variety and the fast pace uh, work uh, where I go into one room, I can do a skin check, do some biopsies, go to the other room, cut off a skin cancer tumor, next room, Botox, next room, see a little toddler, treat him for eczema, next room, do some laser. So it's really, it's a really nice variety. But, um, you know, going back to, if you're on the fence, I would say that I don't want to, I don't want any, anyone to be offended if they're looking into becoming like um, a mid-level, like a PA or an NP. They definitely play a huge part in our medical team, but I definitely would like you all to really take a good look into the medical, you know, going to medical school because the physician shortage, I mean, me coming from Hawaii, I have a lot of guilt not going back to Hawaii to help out with the physician shortage there. But for other reasons, I didn't go back. But in general, we have a very, it's a very big problem, the, the, the physician shortage. And it's just only going to get worse. This pandemic has not helped. I mean, physicians got sick. We got doctors who died from COVID-19 and people went into retirement and they're trying to get them out of retirement to work again. They're even trying to graduate medical students early when things got bad. So I would say that, you know, we're, we're going to need nurse. Nurses are huge. I, I, I think it's a very, it's a very good field to go into, you know, PAs, NPs, they, they help out a lot, but you need leaders, you know, you need physicians, you need, if you're going to have a code, you can't have anyone, you know, um, we can't be deficient in things like that. So we have to have physician uh, leaders who will lead a team. And I hope you all um, really look into it. I want you to reach out to me like you have done on social media, because I want to promote that. I need, I need you guys to really look into it, to take care of me when I'm old. You know, you guys got, you guys are going to be taking care of me. So um, that, that, I think there's a, there's going to be a, a big crisis there. And I'm glad you guys are all interested in, in talking to me about these things. But if you're on the uh, fence, I always say, look into shadowing. My number one thing is go shadow or work in a clinical setting, whether in the hospital or in a dermatology clinic. Um, I have a, my medical assistant, Nicole, she is my personal medical assistant who works with me and she's applying to medical school right now. She doesn't even have any interest in going to dermatology, but just for her to get this experience working with insurance companies, prior authorizations, patients who are happy, patients who are upset, patients who are nervous, she gets to work with all of those different personalities on a daily basis. And so her training, I didn't have that kind of exposure when I was at Kaiser Permanente. She's like in the thick of it. Her, she's going to be ahead of the game later on, but she knows what she's getting herself into because of that. So I would say do that. Um, but don't focus too much on like, oh, what specialty should I get into? Like for me, I switched after my third year of medical school, which is kind of late, but um, thankfully I was competitive enough to, you know, still apply to dermatology because I was thinking of plastic surgery, which is very competitive to get into. Penny? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so I was like debating between getting certified for like MA or like EMT mm. or a CNA. Do you believe like there's one that's like better than the other? Or do you think they're all like good mm. choices? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I did consider to do some of those during, you know, like a summer or something. But yeah, I think medical assistants, I know a lot of people who started off as medical assistants or even scribes in an emergency department. Um, that's probably the, actually to be certified as such, I think that's, I, I don't think it's too intensive, but um, I think the exposure you get as a medical assistant, at least for my medical assistants, is very diverse. Like I, the, the amount that she's soaking in on a daily basis from paperwork to, you know, dealing with patients one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's, it's immense. So I think it's such a valuable experience. I don't think it's necessary because I didn't do anything like that. I, didn't, I thought about becoming an EMT, um, but I didn't end up doing it. I just really focused on school, the extracurriculars, leadership, um, but also networking, trying to meet doctors that you can shadow because you're going to need good letters of recommendation too. And if you do work as a medical assistant, that doctor, if you do a good job, will be your biggest ally. Like I am for my medical assistant. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I wrote her a letter of recommendation. You have to take an extra year to do that. You don't have to, but if you have like, you know, if you, you tried for, to get into medical school and you needed like a plan B, that wouldn't be a bad thing to do. Just to like kind of beef yourself up and, you know, someone who if you can meet, link up with a mentor who also does research and you can do some papers too. In addition, I mean, that's probably the, a, a good scenario there. Yeah. You know, the underdog mentality, or I guess people will say uh, imposter syndrome, like 
you know, for me, I just had to, I, I, I didn't grow up with money. I didn't grow up. I didn't go into any private schools or, you know, I, I had to work my butt off just to get to certain places. So I, whenever I went, I, I got invited to an interview. I never felt like, Oh, maybe I don't deserve it. This is all like based on luck. I, I knew that once I got invited, you know, they saw something in your application, in your personal statement, your scores, your grades. So once you get to the interview, don't think about like, do I deserve to be here? Like I sat next to people in that waiting room for my Harvard interview. And it's like a big double door. Uh, you go into, they open up the door. It's like ceremony. You walk in and they close the door behind you. And it's like a big conference table with all these great minds, these uh, dermatologists who you you see in the research papers and textbooks, and they're all going to grill you. But, you know, so it really could int be intimidating. But, but even before that, I sit in the waiting room and I look to my, my, to my right and I see a guy from, you know, Yale. The other guy to my left is Dartmouth. You know, you got all these like Ivy League New Englanders who know the area very well. They went to really good colleges. So it could mess with your mind. But I actually said, hey, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to go in and be myself. And talk. My thing was don't talk about things that can grill you on because they know more than you do. Even if it is your research topic, they they can really, uh, they call it pimping. I don't know if you guys know that, that term pimping in medical school is like when they quiz you and they test you on the spot. You don't want to have anything, any pimpable material in your interview. So I talked about things like student leadership, extracurriculars, volunteering, homeless outreach, things that they can't quiz you on. And I think they want to take a break from all the nitty gritty science things. And they want to talk about um, your outside interests. I, I brought my artwork to my interviews. So, you know, that kind of breaks up the intensity of things. You can show them your, your artwork and they, you know, of course, they're going to say it, it, it looks good. They're not going to, you know. Uh, <laughs> make fun of your artwork in front of you, but you know it's a nice conversation starter to change the ge change gears. So if you do any have any outside hobbies, feel free to talk about it because they really want to, you know, they want to see will I be okay, you know, um, will I will I would I be okay being on call with this person for eighteen hours? They're actually thinking that when you're applying for residency, so you uh, you really want to come off as a good easygoing team member. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for the um, admissions process and like applying for medical school? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been what was it 2007 to 2008 is when I applied, um, applied because there's primary applications, secondary applications, which is they're just pretty much asking you for like 150 bucks to pay them. And then they give you more questions and that's your secondary application. You, you send them the, those questions back in with your money. Then you wait for an interview offer and um, you know, the more places you apply, obviously the more chances of getting an interview offer. And I think it's, that's the same for residency. You know, when I was a medical student, I actually had more money because I took out loans. I took out a private loan. I, had 50, I took a 15% interest loan just to apply to dermatology residencies. Uh, and I applied, I applied broadly. And um, you applied to like, I don't, I don't know how many programs I applied to, but hundreds say, and you get 12 dermatology interviews. That's how hard it is. And so Harvard, take, they interview, they get like 500 medical students applying. They take 50 people to interview and they only accept like six. So I was one of the six that got in. So medical school, same thing. The, you cast your net broadly, increase your risk or increase your chances of getting an interview. That's for sure. So having fun, saving saving money for the interviews. Right now they're doing virtual interviews, but you know the flights from Hawaii to go to an interview so expensive. Pay for a hotel, you know, plan your trip around storms because of course they always make you interview during the heart of winter. And you know I've known people who had to cancel or miss an interview because of a, a New Englander storm, um, a New nor'easter storm, and that's that would be awful, right? I, you you get an offer to go interview at Harvard and you had to miss it because of the weather. So you actually have to plan accordingly to fly in early, get a hotel room, pay extra, you know, nights to get in early and settle in, get ready for your interview on campus and um, be well rested because you're going to be meeting the people like medical students, you know, um, at the program will be giving you tours. You want to show your best face. You want to be positive, ask good questions, um, be, be well dressed, be prompt, come up with good questions um, for them. Cause they're always going to ask you any questions and you want to have good questions for them. Wouldn't it be a bad idea to link up with pre -med the medical students there in advance and, and kind of ask them questions and get a feel of um, things. And maybe, you know, if you know who you're interviewing with, go on um, PubMed and look and see if they've 
published articles on certain things, what their interests are, um, you know, are they an expert in um, lymphoma, leukemia, infection, I had an infectious disease doctor who was, uh, who would do a lot of inter international work, who, who did my first medical school interview. And so I wanted to focus on talking about my India trip my medical trip to India with him. So you want to do your research beforehand. Sometimes you may not know who you're going to interview with, but um, if you can, if you have the, if you're fortunate to know their name, look them up, know everything about them. If you can be prepared. I'm working with my medical assistant right now. So I'm kind of getting excited with her. She's starting to get her secondary applications and um, you know, they, they will ask about specifically about the school. And so I was able to give her feedback about, um, Hawaii and, you know, it's problem-based learning. You want to know about those things too. Like, is this school didactic based or like Hawaii it's problem-based learning PBL problem-based learning, where we twice a week, we meet up in a small group of medical students with a preceptor attending doctor who goes through a case and we talk through it. We write on a chalkboard or a dry erase board, or maybe now it's all virtual um, now on the computer and they project something on the screen, but we go through it and we kind of come up with learning issues about the case. Then we come back the, the second time of the week, say it's Tuesday, Thursday, Thursday, we come back and we present that question to your whole group. And then you try to figure out what's wrong with the patient, how to treat the patient. We find some closure with the case. And that's how we learn in addition to some didactics, which, um, I preferred being more hands-on. So you also want to look into seeing what kind of learner you are. Are you good with small groups? You know, are you someone who's really good at lectures? And like, my wife is so good at lectures. Like she can um, sit through a lecture and when we talk later, she's like, she'll spit out some small detail. And I'm like, what, well, how do you, how do you know? She's like, well, they just said it. But like for me, I have to go back and I, I'm better at reading on my own and then talking about it in a small group than like having it spoon fed to me in a big lecture hall. So she was really good with that. Whereas I think I was more problem-based learning. She also excelled in problem-based learning too, but um, people are very different. So know that about the school because they might ask you about that. Like, are you, do you think you're a good fit for PBL um, and such? So, um, and then definitely the worst, the kiss of death is if you copy, a lot of the, the, the questions in the secondary are similar. Don't copy and paste, you know, uh, one, you know, and, and just put it right. Make sure to edit it too. Make sure you're not saying University of Hawaii and you're, Stanford <laughs> secondary application and such. So um, I've heard of people doing that mistakenly and you lose $150 uh, secondary application fee just like that. So yeah. Any other questions, guys? Um, I actually had like a personal like life question. Yeah. Um, how are you able to fit in like marriage and like having kids as a physician? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a, a challenge and, um, you know, knowing, you know, that people, it's a great question, actually, especially coming from a young female who I'm here, I'm hearing a lot of people, females, especially, which I get, you know, they're choosing to go the physician assistant route, you know, the shorter training, bring on less debt, you know, because of the medical school is very expensive. And so they choose not to go to medical school, but go and go to PA school because they worry about work-life balance and such and having a family. Um, being married to a female physician, it is a challenge, but definitely doable. I think if I went into plastic surgery, it'd be a different story. If I had to, if I'm working weekends, I'm doing trauma calls and, you know, doing calls in the middle of the night, I have to go to the emergency room. Things would be very different. And I don't know if we would do as well with two kids, two young kids that are two years apart. They're five and they're going to be five and three soon. Um, so it's, it, it definitely depends on your specialty that will help because not all doctor jobs will have to kill you and you have to be a slave to the hospital. Um, internal medicine is very hard and demanding, but they don't always have to be hard and demanding. Like my wife didn't have to do a fellowship to become a hospitalist. She only works 10 days a month and she, um, you know, and that those jobs, you don't have to do a residence, a fellowship. She, she, she had a three-year residency, then worked and started making over $200,000 as a hospitalist working, you know, 10 day shift, 10 uh, shifts a month. And um, whereas if you do a fellowship in internal medicine, say you do nephrology, endocrinology, it's three-year fellowship after um, your residency and you're getting paid, you know, like a resident, say $60,000. Then you come out and you get paid over 200K. If you are doing a procedural fellowship, um, like cardiology, gastroenterology, your payoff will be much higher when you're in attending, but um, it, those are very intense jobs too, like gastroenterology, cardiology, obviously those things are 
pretty intense. So work-life balance, a little harder for those. But my wife actually is really happy with her job. Primary care, we need more primary care doctors. And you can be a primary care doctor right out of your three-year three, three year residency in family medicine or internal medicine. But their work-life balance is also harder with, uh, you know, electronic medical records. You have to deal with every medical issue for each patient. Um, so it's a really hard job for them. It's, it's really hard for them to recruit people. So you got to find something that fits you. My wife has found a nice sweet spot um, as a hospitalist. It's a very popular option for people because you don't have to do the fellowship um, rack, tra track at all. But for me, you know, dermatology, obviously a very good lifestyle. It's probably one of the best lifestyles. No call. I haven't had a pager on me since uh, residency. Um, I haven't, I don't have to work weekends and I work, you know, office hours, 8.30 to 4, 4.30. And um, so I don't want people to think like, you know, that it's, it's you're going to be a slave for the rest of your life. We, we live a normal life. We still, we have zoo memberships, aquarium memberships. I was going to say that the loan part of things, the debt that you carry is not so bad too. I mean, it definitely depends on what specialty you do go into, but if you're smart with your money, you can pay off your loans within say five years after graduating residency. So I don't want people to worry about that because you might see TikToks of people saying like, you know, PA school, less debt, choose PA school, um, which is true, less debt. But I know PAs who are, you know, 20 years older than me that are still paying off their, their student loan debt from, from um, PA school. So it definitely depends on how you are. You have to be disciplined and you guys are being disciplined in organic chemistry. You're gonna be disciplined. You're gonna have to learn how to be disciplined with your money. Um, as an attending physician and you'll make it work and you can. Um, so even if you're not in dermatology where we do make more money than the average uh, doctor, you, you can still be smart with your money and um, pay it off. So I don't want that part scaring you away from applying to medical school as well. That's what I tried to, I made a, a video on paying off student loan debt. You know, a few people did criticize me saying, well, oh, you're a dermatologist. This is a gloat post, but you know, my main intent was really say, we got to learn financial literacy. Like you learn medicine, like you learn chemistry right now. And it's possible. You got to just do the reading. Like I, I don't have to study for any exams right now. Um, I spend my time reading books on finance and such. And uh, I, I, I'm, I, I last two years, I've read like over 20 books on finance just to, um, just to try and find strategies to pay off my loans, which we, we did. We paid off both of our loans um, during a pandemic. So it's, um, you know, it's possible. Um, so what would you say is the hardest part of like your job mm -hmm. and how does it, your schedule look like pre-COVID and maybe like now? Yeah, before COVID, my schedule, you know, four days a week, uh, seeing 120 patients a week, um, you know, I take three to four weeks of vacation and um, during the lockdown, um, one half day a week, only seen five patients. I did some telemedicine virtual visits with only established patients that I've seen before for easy follow-ups like ac uh, acne visits. Um, uh, I would do virtual visits. After the lockdown, um, I slowly ramped up. I didn't want to have my waiting room full of people. And we're still trying to keep the waiting room numbers down. But actually, the demand is very high. It's actually higher than before. Um, a few uh, doctors did retire. They were on the older side, and they didn't want to work during this time just for safety reasons. And they said, oh, it's a good time to, to uh, close shop. And they were really nice to refer their patients to me. So patients that they've seen for 30 plus years were now my patients all of a sudden. So my numbers really went up. Um, I don't know if the social media reach has made people want to come to me. I also won um, top doctor awards this year and such. So my numbers really went up. The demand's high. I'm booking out way in advance. And so I'm really full. And because Washington's doing fairly well, we can actually see a lot of people um, because uh, the, the, the concern is very different from how it was in um, April. But although the numbers are creeping up, I checked this morning. So um, we're going we're gonna to be safe about it. I don't want to just have the floodgates open all the time, but I'm going to keep up with the news. But um, yeah, in terms of uh, my practice, you know, people still want cosmetics and, you know, the, they come with their own challenges, patients who want cosmetics because they um, are not always happy. They're very, you know, nitpicky about certain details. They want, they, they some of them have sadly have body dysmorphic disorder. So cosmetics have its own challenges where you don't have to work with insurance because it's out of pocket. 
Um, in medical dermatology, you definitely have everything go through insurance and we're dealing with insurance is probably the challenges of my job. Probably the number one challenge of my job um, is dealing with insurance because a lot of times I want to give a medicine that insurance won't cover and I have to give them all the other inferior technology before they'll approve the, the new and improved iPhone 11 medication for patients. So that's a challenge. I also deal with 30 patients a day. It's 30 different personalities. Most of my patients I love, I have a great relationship with, but there are patients who are friends with Dr. Google and they love going on social media and, you know, getting bad information from non-dermatologists there that I have to actually spend a lot of time trying to say, Hey, reverse all those bad habits. Let's start all over. This is what I recommend. And sometimes they even say, I don't want it because they, I, I didn't see it on YouTube and they will even, you know, won't take the medication. I, a board certified dermatologist recommend. Um, so that's the challenges in today's day and age is that people have so much access to technology and information, a lot of it bad information. I got to help. I got to battle that too. So, but a good question. <laughs> Overall, I love my job. <laughs> um, I know you talked a little bit before yeah. about patients using the internet and stuff like that. Yeah. Other source of information. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering like, what's the most popular dermatology myth online that you've heard a lot of people believe in? Um, yeah, good question, Megan. Uh, ooh, dermatology myth. I mean, so things that I post about that people get very upset about or that is considered controversial would be, you know, acne, acne treatments, especially the medication isotretinoin, um, which I, I don't even want to go into because there's so many, you know, sides of the coin out there. But um, I, I got I get a lot of criticism on things like that. And also just things like Neosporin, you know, I try to I do a post on Neosporin and people get really upset as if they're getting paid by Neosporin. But I'm just trying to say that Neomycin and Neosporin causes a lot of bad allergic rashes. And I used to get called in in the middle of the night to see those rashes. And there are patients who are suffering it for like six months, and no one could tell that it was an allergic rash and they were treating it for an infection. People were getting pick lines in and, you know, antibiotics for months and they, everyone's scratching their heads. And I just come in, it was a, it was a neomycin, neosporin the whole time. And so it's just me kind of giving those little things. What else did people get? I mean, um, so far, I mean, I think those are the two biggest things that people get upset about. I guess biotin is also another thing people get touchy about. We try to, we're saying now biotin, the hair supplement isn't very effective now that the studies, we're looking at more of the studies. It also can be harmful. It can throw off your laboratory results. When you get your blood drawn, um, it could um, mess with your thyroid um, hormone results and also uh, mess with troponin. So it could even mask a heart attack and people get misdiagnosed for a heart attack because of being on high dose biotin for hair loss. So um, the, my, my colleague made a post on it recently and he got a lot of hate from that as if they're getting paid by hair, skin and nails, biotin supplements. I mean, people get really passionate about these things. For me, when I prescribed um, a certain retinoid for a patient that was newer because she had really sensitive skin, uh, this retinoid had less um, chances of irritation. She called me back saying, I don't want it because um, my YouTube influencers didn't mention it in their videos. And I was shocked. I was like, wow, really? You're gonna you're not gonna take this medication. So they wanted something else. TikTok, there's so many bad things and they're even like Photoshop um, things as well. You know, those, those little, those, those pore strips and such like that. There's so many bad. Um, and there's also, I, I think the other thing is that people are selling these things to destroy moles, which you should never try to destroy a mole at home. Like you have to see a dermatologist to get them removed because we, I don't even freeze moles off or burn them that you shouldn't, you should actually should cut them and biopsy them. Because if you ever try to laser one off and hide the surface, what say if it was a melanoma it's as brewing underneath your that could be a, a really fatal mistake there and they have those things being sold online that people are buying those pens that you can erase your moles like that's that's dangerous stuff you see any um did you have any myth bus questions megan in particular no but um <laughs> i just wanted to know because like i've seen a lot of things on tiktok and i wasn't sure if like they were real or not yeah, no, it's, um, it's really, it's really, so it's, it's, it's hard for us to try and come up from a good place and say and educate. And there's people who are set in their ways like Neil Sporn and they like just last night, 
there someone said why do people have been using this for hundreds of years and thousands of people have done well with it you know why why do you come out and attack it like that and i'm like well you know this is my job i've seen the bad cases and i said please cite your sources shows my skin's my source i'm like that's not a credible source is that just because it did you did well with it you know just because you smoked 10 packs a day and you never got lung cancer doesn't mean it's not a carcinogenic habit right so it's just it is just people are set in their ways and they get really passionate and upset and they they have it may, they, we make it so easy for them to attack us professionals uh we put ourselves out there um you know just for me dancing and, and giving advice i put myself out there and i get criticized for be not being professional or being embarrassing to the medical community i'm like no we're, we can be people too like some of them say like you shouldn't even be using your time to be doing this i'm like my free time is none of your business we are normal human beings we can do these things as well i like to dance as a stress reliever too with my kids so you know it's just uh you can <laughs> anything i post if i ever get a troll comment i know it's going to do well that video so um <laughs> It's just an indicator it's you're reaching people who you don't normally reach. And um, there are people who are just it's surprising that they'll they'll find a way to fight you on anything, you know, no matter how positive your post will be. Thanks for letting me vent there, guys. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any more questions? Um, I would just like to say thank you for posting about the Neosporin because oh, I didn't yeah. know about that. And then after I watched that video, I started using like Aquaphor. And stuff. Oh, nice. <laughs> Good job, Tiffany. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that feedback. Yeah. That's um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a real thing. And if you look at my colleagues, they say the same too. So it's not like I'm coming up with this novel idea. I have this, uh, this battle against Neosporin. I don't, it's just really how we trained and, at Harvard, that was like the first thing. If you see a rash that looks like it's from an outside job, like a, some kind of contact, whether it's poison ivy or something, the first thing I'm going to ask is, have you tried Neosporin? And they, when they say yes, I'm like, bingo, stop that and let's go forward. Yeah. So good questions, um, guys. Yeah. On, uh -huh. Oh, congrats on top doctor, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I got a few this year. And the Seattle Met one was really exciting to be in the local magazine. So. Thank you. Um, Thanks for that. Is it okay if we take a photo with you? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. How do you do that? Um, I'll switch it to gallery mode and then I'll take a quick photo. Oh yeah, that's cool. My face is peeling from the TCA peel, by the way. If you, I don't know <laughs> if it shows on this resolution, but. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, we should um, do that too. <laughs> Say hi, guys. Okay. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. Yeah, yeah no, thank, thank you. Of course. Thanks, guys, for having me. I hope you guys keep in touch on social media. Good luck with everything. If you have any questions, please reach out and good luck. Thank you. They, um, is it also okay if we post like a photo about you on our Instagram story? Oh yeah, that's fine. Totally fine. Yeah. Thanks guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Have a great yeah, rest of your day. You too. Appreciate it guys. Have a good one. Good luck. Bye. Take Thank care. You. Be safe too. Bye. Bye.